All right, guys, we're back. Pucks with Hags, John Zanis, Joe Haggerty. Still talking about what happened uh, to the Bruins, I guess. You know, whether you're over it or not, Joe, uh, it's it, it still lingers. And as uh, as we heard from uh, upper management uh, this past week with, uh, you know, Don Sweeney, Cam Neely, even Charlie got to say a thing or two. Charlie Jacobs jumps in there. Oh, uh, talking and, about the Centennial Xanus. It was great. That's what yeah, I really care about. I know. I was there for Charlie. Uh, and Jim Montgomery, uh, kind of another uh, post-mortem here uh, with the thing. Yeah. And is that, I, one thing that will really echo with me is Don Sweeney. I mean, it was Don or Cam saying that they feel it in their bones. You know, like, this does not go away. So if you're a Bruins fan and you're still aching seeing hockey playoffs and – Thinking, what if? What could have been? Could you have just gotten through here? Um, they are too, because this is a, this was a once in a lifetime opportunity squandered that you don't get back, uh, and they know it, and they all know it. And we're going to dissect that a little bit. Uh, we're also going to be joined by a special guest a little bit later in the show. Joe, tell us who that's going to be. Uh, stand-up comedian Dave Russo. Uh, Bruins fans will will certainly know him. Uh, he does a yeah. lot of events with the Boston Bruins alumni and the Boston Bruins Foundation. Funny guy, huge Bruins fan, uh, does a lot of work with the retired players and hangs out with them a lot. So I'm sure I'll have some stories and an interesting take or two on on how things ended. But, uh, you know, it's great to always get the fans' perspective on how painful this was and what how they saw this whole thing going because, you know, uh, after us in the media have been around for so long. We get a little jaded with this, and we do. I'm sure it's still a fresh wound for Dave Russo. We do, and, you know, it's a, maybe it, – can we laugh about it yet? Maybe not, but some comedic yeah. therapy here might help. So it really we'll get did that. feel like a funeral uh, at the Garden on, on Tuesday morning. Uh, there's no – like it was the, the – talking yeah. about the recent death of, of something or somebody, you know. Like very similar as Cam said to 2019 when they blew the Stanley Cup final and didn't win and lost in seven games on their own home ice. Not quite as bad because they weren't that close to winning the championship. But if they got through the first round, the wild, wild west, as uh, as Jim Montgomery called it, who knows yeah. what would happen. Yeah, talking to, talking to Cooper over at Tampa about getting out of that first round and how, cha- how challenging it could be. And it really is interesting. We'll also talk to your uh, to Dave about uh, about that exactly, which is do you feel better or worse now uh, seeing that what Florida has been doing to Toronto and how yep. that impacts things as well uh, a little better because Florida looks good, but bad also because, you know, Toronto looked pretty beatable too. And that path to the cup, if you just get through it, and again, we, we're not going to go there now, uh, but we are going to get into the press conference first off want to tell you the podcast and the show is brought to you as always by FanDuel exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. When you sign up now at FanDuel.com slash Boston, you get 1,000 in no sweat first bet. That means, Joe, you can bet 1,000, lose it, get it right back and an opportunity to make good. So you basically get two cracks at it. Uh, Sounds if you like a roller do coaster ride I'm looking for, Xanis. Let's yeah. do it. So that's exactly what you want to do. Let's get to the press conference now, and there's a few different things. When you have everybody together, from ownership to upper management uh, to uh, you know to the head coach, you're covering a lot of different things in a lot of different ways. So obviously, you have Sweeney Neely talking about. I can fix that. I can <laughs> fix that. Okay, ready? Three. Yeah. Um, Ahmed, we're gonna edit here. Eight fifty mark. I'm just gonna write it down. Joe's phone rings. Also, if you're ever recording on your own, this is a good note. Yep. Um, it's not live, so stop if anything gets weird. Okay. Hold on. Uh, there we go. Okay, recording pod. Okay, um, 8.50 mark. I'm just making a note to myself. Stop. 8.50 edit. Okay. It sounded like you were just working up to throw to the uh, first set. Yep. Okay. Um, so let's get back to it into that press conference, those press conferences we talked about here. And uh, you, as we said, Joe, you're talking to a whole bunch of different people here about a whole bunch of different things uh, with upper management, uh, ownership, and obviously uh, the head coach, Jim Montgomery. So uh, – Don and Cam are going to be talking about the roster construction. We know they have problems. We know they went all in in terms of resources, uh, not just with draft picks, but with money, the cap penalties that they're going to pay for Bergeron and Krejci, and just the money that just doesn't exist to fill out a roster here that is pretty thin. There's not a lot of people remaining under contract, certainly among the forwards here. So they have seven a lot of questions. Seven, seven forwards, forwards they got next season. Six million for seven yes. forwards. They've got some Janus. decisions. So 
Uh, we'll get into the Sweeney stuff, but what I thought the headline was uh, to me was just kind of an acknowledgement of how they – fumbled it, essentially, coming from Jim Montgomery. The general vibe here, a lot of these end-of-the-season press conferences, Joe, a lot of people's ire is directed at Don Sweeney. Why didn't you do, and those guys, why didn't you do more? If you'd only gotten that, once again, you you, you, you gave us a roster as a fan, you're thinking. You gave us a roster that couldn't win. You know this team can't win in the playoffs. You did it to us again. That right. wasn't the case this year. This team was freaking loaded. This team had no flaws. This team absolutely should still be playing hockey right now. It was a Every, wagon, Dennis. Let's call it what it was. A it wagon, was wagon. And everybody knows it. Yep. Um, so, Joe, this felt like the way they talked about it, both the players and the coach, kind of acknowledged that they knew that and that they themselves dropped the ball. You asked uh, specifically uh, to Jim Montgomery at the press conference on Tuesday, so, you know, kind of what went down? What do you think you could have changed? Uh, and the answer from Montgomery was pretty much everything. You know, the overriding one is it's my job to get players to own the moment, seize the moment. And that didn't happen, right? And that falls on me. <clears throat> and I think with the hard times we went through, right, we have to learn from them, right? If we don't learn from them, how are we going to grow? Like, we will just repeat the same thing next year. Um, so for me, it's... Being able to connect with the players over the course of the summer and build through training camp about what we have to do to make sure that we don't have the same energy level because we didn't have the same energy level we had in the regular season. We didn't have the same uh, puck confidence that we had in the regular season, you know, and it hurts right now. Like, I mean, it's, it's, I've talked to players, you know, like it's hard right now. It's hard for our fans. It's hard for us. And the price we pay is we have to learn from it so that we move forward. You know, specifically, I mean, hindsight, you can go back and look at everything, right? Um, but the two things that, you know, come to mind would have been like what I've learned. I already talked about the toll on the goaltenders and, you know, going to sway a little earlier. What game that is, you know, that's debatable. Again, that's hindsight. Um, you know, not starting with my normal lines for game five. I have my logic as to why it made sense, but it didn't help us with our start, obviously, right? Um, so that I learned from. And, you know, I think I could have switched the D pairings on who the matchups were a little bit quicker. Um, we were shutting down one line really well. We weren't shutting down another line really well. We did for two games, but we didn't for five. You know, those are the things that really stick with me. But the number one thing is, is my job is to get the players to elevate their games, and I didn't do that. Yikes, Joe. I mean, <laughs> co coach, I mean, what's left? You know, could he have sold something different at the concession stands? Coaching, I mean, I mean, uh, goaltending, the yeah. defense pairings, the lines, not preparing them mentally. Almost everything is like, I, I guess I kind of did all of it wrong. Yeah. Uh, other than that, how was the play, Mrs. Lincoln? It's one of those <laughs> right? situations, you know, yeah. like, I, I, look, I, 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 it's funny. You're going to think this is funny that I say this, right? <laughs> but I actually... While uh, I was, you know, it was correct and proper and accountable that he said all those things because he was exactly right. And he got crucified by pretty much everybody that covers the team uh, for the litany and the laundry list of mistakes that he made between going away from the goalie rotation, uh, uh, putting these forward lines together to start game five that had never played together before, including separating Brad Marchand and Patrice Bergeron, putting Connor Clifton in uh, in game six uh, in place of Matt Grizzlick, who had played well in the series. And just in, in uh, essence, almost coaching uh, afraid or coaching uh, like they were losing the series when they were up three to one going in that game five rather than coaching like they were winning. Uh, and it even comes down to, and even though he had disagreed with me on this, uh, putting Patrice Bergeron in that series, I still think it's a serious consideration to have rested him, waited, and brought him back in the second round if things were going that well without him to give him a few more days with a herniated disc, for goodness sake, that he was playing through. You give him as much time as you can and try to get him ready for the second round. I feel like if you've got control of a, a playoff series like they did against Flora when they are up 3-1. But bottom line, I was actually encouraged, Zanis, by hearing all this. 
I was actually that in makes courage you feel better. I heard all of this from top to bottom when he basically admitted that he messed up the goalies, the defensemen, and the forwards, which is pretty much everybody uh, in a playoff series. But I was encouraged that he actually finally realized it was being accountable and was admitting it. See, right? Because I, I thought the major problem I had was during the playoffs – especially after game seven, when we asked what regrets he had, what second guesses, what we would have done differently. All he said was mention the forward lines in game five. And even that was kind of like, Oh, you know, but I changed eight minutes in. So it really didn't make that much of a difference. No, it made a huge difference. It was a slow start in a huge game that you ultimately needed to win in order to advance past that yeah. Florida Panther series. That was your choice right there and your chance. But like the fact that he thought about it, marinated over it, probably got reamed by fans, by, you know, management, whoever, and he realized that he screwed up a lot more than he thought he had. That I took as a sign that, okay, he's going to learn from this experience and he's going to be better the next time around. And what happened was this is the first time a coach had those kind of expe- – that coach had these kind of expectations going into a playoff series and he kind of choked. You know, he got caught up in the moment. It was too big for him. And that now that he realizes the mistakes he made and why he made them, he's going to learn from them moving forward. And it's funny. He talked about during the year – how uh, he talks about like, you know, uh, focusing on the process. The process is the big thing to him. That's kind of his mantra. And the team sort of took it on as the year was going to focus on that instead of what else is going on. He said he learned that because as a player at the University of Maine, the first time he was in the Frozen Four, he choked. He played terrible. He was horrible because he got caught up in how big the moment was, right. where he was, the crowds he was going to play in front of, like the gravity of the situation. And he admitted that he choked. And he learned from it after the fact. And he went on to win the national championship with Maine a couple of years later when Paul Correa was there, partly because he learned from that experience. And I almost take that as encouraging that he now realizes he screwed up a lot more than he thought he did after thinking about it. And he's going to be accountable and he's going to adjust and he's going to learn from it. And and I um, honestly felt a little more encouraged by that. If he had come to the press conference and said, you know, we just didn't execute, like, that's it, like, end of story, and tried to give these vanilla answers, I would have been so down on him, I would have felt like that they needed to make a change right then and there. Okay. But the fact that he said what he said right. leaves some encouragement that they're actually going to learn from this moving forward. And, you know, the, it's too bad because the milk is spilled. They're not going to have a team like this so ever again, which is That's what problem. I'm talking about. Like, but but from- at least as a coach and as a guy that's probably going to be here next year, he's learned yeah. from it and he's going to be a better coach. So that part of it is good. Yes, I, I totally, I totally get that uh, line of thinking. But I, I do think, as people in the media, you go there. We ask questions of people. We want to hear honest answers. We want them to, you know, give it to us straight. You want yep. people to be accountable to themselves. Um, but as a fan, uh, him saying to make this many mistakes is almost like having oh, it's lost. Frustrating. It's like having lost a loved one in the operating room and the doctor comes out after and is like, yes. I guess I shouldn't have removed their heart. I should have just, uh, you know, I should have just, you know, you know, done the very simple procedure. I like, should have hit that big red button that said, don't press this button. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, I you know, and, you, and you're yeah. like, so, yeah, maybe you won't do that next time, but you you. Yeah. They, they, he, you killed this good. This was a team, as you said, it's a it was a one shot deal, and they had it. They were they were stewards of something that was really precious to a lot of Bruins fans, which was an opportunity for the cup. Obviously, they want it too. They want it more. Patrice wants it. This and that. But I mean, to the fans, this was we. I mean, there was a responsibility there. So if you're a fan sitting at home. <clears throat> It's fine for the future. It's fine for Montgomery's development. It's fine for whatever goes forward. But you know it's not a run-it-back scenario. You hear you make mistakes with a young team and you've got chances to kind of roll it back again. Different. This was – you really dropped something and it's it's broke into a thousand pieces and you cannot put it back together. And this is is the only aspect where I feel like management has culpability, right? Because they built a wagon of a team – Don Sweeney got Garnett Hathaway, Dmitry Orlov, Tyler Bertuzzi at the trade deadline. Like, they put everything and all the pieces in place they did it. to win. Like, they understand that, you know, the the it was all in to win the cup, and anything less than that was going to be a disappointment and falling short and unacceptable. It's for, the Bru- for Bruins management to take an experienced coach that had been to the Stanley Cup final before, that had been in tons of playoff series, that had the experience – and fire him and bring in a coach that, yes, he's played a, a playoff series or two in Dallas, which they're not even paying attention to the Stanley Cup playoffs in Dallas, even in the spring, when, when that's like about spring football and high school football. Like, that's a bigger deal than the Dallas Stars in, in, in Texas. 
Um, you know, so the pressure was not there like it was here to bring in a coach that had been successful in the college ranks, successful in the junior ranks, but like was largely into almost wholly unproven in the Stanley Cup playoffs. And with these kind of veteran players and with this kind of expectations on the line, like there is some culpability there for them putting this coach in place that clearly was not ready for the moment uh, when it arrived. And when the playoffs started here now, Cam Neely mentioned in the press conference that everybody's expectations was that the Bruins were going to be a wild card team. They were not going to have this kind of season, that it was not sure. going to be, you know, the, this uh, breaking 65 win 135 point season. And that's true. But by the same token, I think we all agreed and we all realized and acknowledged this was probably going to be Patrice Bergeron's last season, most yeah. likely. And you're going to be trying to win for Patrice Bergeron. Like that's, you know, what you're trying to do. That's the, the goal is you're going to do everything you can to try to win for him. So you wanted to put a coach in place that you thought was going to get it done in the playoffs and was going to be able to handle this kind of experienced group where Patrice Bergeron was essentially going to be a player coach uh, the entire year. And, you know, in that aspect, Bruins management kind of failed with the choice they made. Now, is, is Montgomery going to end up learning from this and taking them somewhere down the line two or three years from now? Maybe. But in this particular season, in this situation, I think his the choice of him as coach, great during the regular season, but a spectacular failure during the playoffs when it really mattered. Celtics could be going through the same thing exactly yeah. right now, yep. which is a team that, by all accounts, absolutely should be the favorites to win it all. And you are running into some are you ready for the moment situations here with the head coach. So you're seeing yep. it from a fan perspective. It's like, oh, why did you trust this? You know, like it's, you know. It doesn't make you feel good, and I, you know, I'm not yep. sure that uh, Montgomery stuff necessarily makes people feel better. But at least, again, uh, there's an acknowledgement of what needs to happen, and if he's going, I to just, I just on, felt a lot better about him going forward, coaching the Boston Bruins yes. after hearing what yeah. I heard in that press conference, rather than. Uh, him talking about being confused after Game Seven. Totally. <laughs> when he said that, I was like, "This guy has no idea what just happened." Or kind Game of Six headlight. being a great hockey like, game. Yeah, yeah. And after Game Six, right? A lot of the stuff he was saying during the series, it was very obvious that things sped up on him, and that he was not quite ready for what was going on around we're, him. We're ready for this opportunity for Game Seven. It was you. You could tell the moment was big, and he was trying to he was trying yeah. to shrink it back down. Um, another thing mentioned in the press conference from Cam Neely, we talk about like what the coach could have done differently and, and, and not in only what he was doing with the personnel, but preparing people to play. Um, it was clear also just from Cam, they were talking about the exit interviews that they were having with the players that they themselves were apologetic for what had happened uh, and how, how, you know, their role in the team's ultimate failure. And here's what Cam had to say uh, on that, on that, uh, on that topic. If you recall going into last season, everybody had a, a, a potential wild card team. So there were zero expectations going into that, this past season, especially with the injuries we had to start the year. So I think, uh, you know, with the, with the change that we made with the head coach, um, you know, everybody was questioning where we were going. So we ended up having this historic year. My concern was going to, was, was, okay, are the guys going to put too much pressure on themselves because of the regular season we had? And the expectations just went through the roof. So I had a couple of players at the exit meetings actually apologize, say, you guys gave us a wagon of a team, and we didn't execute. So, the, you know, players, they know. You know, players know when, when you have a chance to win, they know when you don't have a chance to win. They knew we had a chance to win. They knew we had a chance to go deep. And for whatever reasons... We didn't play the way we did in the regular season. We, we you know, touched on game, game three was probably our best game. But we didn't play the way we, we played with the regular season. I don't know the confidence, the nerves, what it was. But these are the things that we got to dig into. Because, uh, you know, I just, I just saw, you know, and narrative started to change about you win the President's Trophy. No teams rarely win the Stanley Cup. So all those things, the outside noise maybe creeped inside a little bit for me. So it is surprising, you know, considering you did have a veteran presence on this team that they, that the moment would be too large for some of the players, but you could tell that they were playing tight. And again, I think as, 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 as you alluded to earlier, the expectation of the team coming in was that of a uh, let's hold the line until we get healthy and maybe get in as a wild card and see if we can make some noise. And yep. then they turned into a freaking wagon. Um, and the players, you know, you heard it there. You, you gave us a wagon and we mucked it. Um, 
<laughs> they might have played like it, but they might not have had the mentality of it. Um, and I think that was evident. They were playing um, scared, tight. Um, some of the stuff that they were so good at, Joe, the puck possession, moving the puck through the zone, crisp passing, uh, you know, exits, entries, all of these things, they weren't doing a, a nearly as much. They looked like they were playing a different brand of hockey. It wasn't just the coming to the pressure of the Florida Panthers forecheck, which happened, but they themselves were not making, they were passing too much, uh, you know, not getting pucks on net, not doing what they normally do. They looked like they were a totally different team than, than than what we've seen throughout the course of the entire regular season. Well, and this is why um, people that have been around a while like me that have covered the team were kind of sound, sounding the alarm intermittently throughout the year uh, that it was not a good thing that they were going no more than like two games without losing. You know, uh, it, they, they were winning almost every single game. There was like one or two two-game losing streaks. You know, they didn't have an extended losing streak or this extended period where things started to spiral out of control and maybe players started blaming each other behind closed doors or like there were arguments. There was, you know, all kinds of stuff like that uh, where they were put sort of through the ringer and they had the stress test uh, of a hockey team to see, you know, if they were going to be able to get through that and get back to their game. And I don't think they had enough of that during the regular season. And it was problematic when it happened during the playoffs. And there is a lot to be said for it wasn't you know obviously Florida is is exposing Toronto with their forecheck too and there's something going on there where they are super heavy and fast with the forecheck physical on top of teams taking them out of their games there's absolutely something there but i think the bigger thing for the bruins is it took them like two games to get into the series it yeah. took them two games to get up to that speed because they had been playing at a slower speed and they hadn't been challenged enough and people were playing nice with the Bruins down the stretch and not really in their, in their face like the Florida Panthers were. And it was a shock to the system. And we see this happen almost every year with the President's Trophy winner with the top seeds where it takes them a game or two to get up to the speed of the wildcard teams yeah. and what they've been playing at for months. And sometimes taking a game or two is too late. Yeah. You know, in this particular instance, though, it wasn't like – the Bruins got to their game. It wasn't, and honestly, they and, and in the lost middle of the series, show, the, like, the problem became, I think, is they got unglued as the series was going on because they hadn't been through that kind of adversity during the year, especially the defensemen. I think defensemen were a mess uh, for the most part, and they had one that didn't play like he did at all during the regular season, Hampus Lindholm, who right. now we've got to wonder if he's like a regular season performer that doesn't do it under playoff pressure and you know what was going on there. And the goaltending completely betrayed them. The goaltending, which was, I think, their greatest strength all year, which kept them from losing any of these games in a row, just completely exploded and, and blew up on them. And, and once again, I think there's going to be a ton of questions moving forward about Linus Ulmark to the point where they may even look um, to potentially move him at some point, feeling like he might be one of those guys that can play well during the regular season but is not a playoff performer and they also have a guy in Jeremy Swayman who is going to start earning a lot more money starting this year. He's going to enter his second contract. So, like, there's some dynamics there. But I think it's because Allmark was so bad yeah. during these playoffs, so inconsistent, so different from the Vesna Trophy level that he was during the season, and because you started hearing these reports about him playing through a catastrophic injury. And I thought it was really interesting that right out of the gate – Don Sweeney said Patrice Bergeron was playing with more of a catastrophic injury than Linus Elmark was. Right. You know, and that's basically saying like, you know, Linus, like, uh, know your role and settle down, buddy. You weren't playing through anything close to a herniated disc in your back. And that's not an excuse. And I think that right. was the message kind of that they were sending Maybe. out. That you just didn't play well. Maybe. You know? I, I, I could see it that way. I could also see it as trying to take a little bit of the heat off Montgomery for, for his uh, decision making or just simply a, yeah, he was playing with something. It might have reduced him a little. Still doesn't excuse necessarily how bad he was. It was not – he was he was bad beyond what the injury should have caused uh, yes. at this point. So, yeah. But I, I also think they didn't like that uh, it was the playing up of the injury during the series higher than it was probably was as an excuse. And I think that's what that report was put out there as – from somebody that wanted to try to make excuses for why the you know what yeah. what was going on with the play, you know where this stuff comes from. I mean, you know, obviously things like this usually come from player agents. It is what it is. Uh, but yes, or that camp. Uh, so uh, 
the extent of it, sure. Uh, the Bergeron, obviously, the herniated disc thing. We don't. We're not sure if he would have ever been better throughout the course of the playoffs if he would have had a chance to do that. So, yeah. Uh, but as you mentioned, Swayman and um, and Ulmark, it really does seem like an obvious luxury at this point to have two top flight, at least statistically speaking, this 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 year. I mean, you want to go by geek stats, you know, saves above expected per sixty. Yeah. Ulmark one. Swayman, too, during yeah. the course of the regular season. Pretty remarkable. And you're not talking about a guy who played 15, 18, 20 games. He played 30-plus games. So Swayman has shown he's capable of being, if not a top Vezina-level goalie, a top third of the NHL-level goalie. So the question yes. is, do you move on from one? And Swayman's an RFA, and he's going to get a – if you want to keep him, he's going to get money. It certainly makes sense to move one or the other and not have that because you need cap management. Speaking of the cap management – Don Sweeney, again, this is the third piece to kind of like, yeah, we really screwed up and we really can't roll it back. We cannot run it back. And we knew this and you knew this, which is why it was so much more important that they get it done this year because they're going to be seriously challenged trying to put a roster together for next year that's going to be anywhere nearly uh, as competitive here and they just don't have enough coming up behind them uh, in Providence or... Uh, or the pipeline to be able to just say, I'll just run this guy up, run this guy up. So you're going to be looking at a lot of cheapy kind of foray player contracts, guys who can just, you know, you find off the scrap heap to fill the roster unless you get really creative. So here's Don Sweeney at the press conference, uh, pretty much openly acknowledging like, yeah, it's, it's not going to be the same team. Our cap situation, we, we, we leveraged, you know, a little bit. Everybody knows our overage at, at, at four and a half. So we have some constraints as to several other teams around the league. Um, our goal was to put, you know, this season was to put the absolute best roster we could we could put together, um, and and try and take a, a real legitimate run, and we failed, uh, no question. So you know we have to pay that forward a little bit. That might mean we're instituting younger players. That might mean roster changes, which we would like to to make. That might mean I might be able to sign, as you reference, one of those three players or other unrestricted players. We have to uh, address the two RFAs and Frederick and Swayman, which we will do. Um, and, you know, roster changes are likely coming. You know, we're not going to be the same team. Um, but our mandate uh, internally, collectively as a group, is we have a really strong core guys that, that hopefully, as Jimmy was talking about, will we'll continue to grow. We'll take leadership responsibility moving forward, regardless of whether or not Patrice and David walk back through the door, because they need to. That's the, you know, Charlie referenced the, the 100 years. Well, these guys are part of the next 100, and they should understand that, that you know, the expectations don't change in that regard. I mean, so there it is, Joe. It's not a secret, but all of those additions, Hathaway, Orlov, uh, Bertuzzi, uh, you know, some of your own players here, uh, Felino, like, I, you do not have the money. <laughs> I mean, and then you don't no. even know if, if a Bergeron or someone else wants to return. The money simply does not exist unless you make, you not just move one per, you might have to move two sizable contracts to be able to have the roster flexibility. And then yeah. you can't necessarily just say, I'll move Hall and sign. Bert. You can't go one for one with it. you got to move a couple of contracts just to be able to get enough professional hockey players to round out a roster, let alone keep some of the guys who you had last year that you might want to retain. So yeah, it's, it's, some, it's some hard choices. It, there are, but I think you look at it from a, a cold, hard uh, roster building perspective and you take areas of surplus and, excess that you have and you yeah. trade from there which is defense they have two well defense and goaltending they have Allmark and Swayman but they also have Brandon Bussey down in Providence who is uh they're very high on and he's cheap he's a young player so I think there's a, a lot a very strong logical argument to make that you trade Allmark and you go you with to. Swayman and Bussey especially if you feel like Swayman now after a few years under his belt is ready to take on the number one role and as you reference defense where I'm going to expect Matt Grizzlick is going to get shopped. I'm going to expect Brandon Carlo might get shopped a little, even though I thought he was one of their best defensemen totally. uh, in the playoffs. Certainly they're going to try to take a, uh, find a taker for Mike Riley's contract. I would uh, say it's an almost certainty that Connor Clifton is not going to be back because of the guys that they already have six players signed, Jakobs Borrell being one of them. And that, that's part of the reality is Jakobs Borrell might become one of your, your six defensemen Has next year. Be. 
night in and night out. But the other part of it is Mason Lowry, who they just signed to a two-year entry-level contract, their top defenseman prospect. He's going to get strong consideration as well and is probably going to make – but you that's know, whether fine. it's Forbort, whether it's Grizzly, somebody else, he's going to make at least one or two of those guys expendable because you're bringing him in. But Most that's rosters the circle have that, of life Joe. with the salary cap in the NHL. Most rosters have that, though, Joe. Yes. It's okay. That's the thing is, like, you're building a fantasy team, you know, with last year's team of, like, professional, high-caliber players everywhere. Most teams are not yep. built that way. you got to yep. survive with some of those type of cheaper players and in the bottom yes. defense pairing and in your lower lines. It's just how big is the drop-off. The question with the Bruins is the, the talent throughout. When you're, when you're losing your top two centermen, filling that, even if you re-sign people who were here last year, you're talking about what? If Bergeron and Krejci don't return, you're talking about Zaka and Coyle Zaka being and Coyle. top two centermen. I mean, it, yeah, games three and games That's where four you're against gonna struggle more. would be your yeah. win window into what it's going to look like next year and they actually played okay they're not going to be Bergeron and Krejci certainly not but you're also going to have some pretty good players on the wing they're going to be able to pull them for I I was encouraged by what I saw out of Zaka this whole season I thought he's a better player than I thought he was but the bottom line the one other thing I want to mention is of those three players Don Sweeney Sweeney mentioned a couple times of the three players they traded for that maybe one would be signable I think it's a no-brainer it's going to be Tyler Bertuzzi that they want and they want to keep Totally. Great on the net front, outstanding chemistry with uh, with David Pasternak, definitely a hard-nosed player that doesn't mind going to the dirty areas, like fit in really well as far as everything that the Bruins do. And, and I think that is the guy that they would pay uh, a little bit more to keep because he can put the puck in the net. He's two years, just one year removed uh, from a 30-goal right. season. Uh, but I would expect Dmitry Orlov is maybe going to go back to the Capitol, certainly going to be more expensive, and they have enough, enough defensemen already. And Garnet Hathaway, I think, is going to cost too much money for a bottom six forward. It was nice when he came here, plays like a Bruin should, was like the prototypical Bruins player, hard hitter, uh, you know, gritty, all that stuff. But they're, they're, somebody's going to overpay for him, and the Bruins do not have the cap nope. space to pay he's a luxury. bottom six forwards. Yes. Yeah, he's a luxury. No doubt about it. And so those questions are going to continue. Uh, as we continue doing this podcast here uh, through the offseason, we'll start to look really, really hard and start to kind of really thin slice some of these decisions. Uh, Joe will put his GM hat on and we'll kind of break down okay what do you do with the forward group who do you keep who do you move some creative trade suggestions um, some you know people out there some free agents that they might consider players that they may bring back we'll look at all of the RFAs there's going to be a ton of that stuff uh, going on through what obviously is a much longer off season than we expected uh, this team would have uh, we're going to continue on with the pod we do want to tell you uh, first off uh, about FanDuel once again if you don't know about it, you haven't signed up, or you've been living under a rock, you know here in Massachusetts that uh, sports betting is legal, and FanDuel is the number one sports book in America and the exclusive wagering partner of CLNS Media Network. Also, uh, for those of you not just hockey fans, basketball fans, FanDuel is also the uh, exclusive partner of the NBA, and the NBA playoffs, as you know, are well in full swing here, and you can head over to FanDuel and check that out. Get in on the action, whatever you want to do here at FanDuel.com slash Boston. Uh, when you do that, you get 1000 in bonus bets uh, right off the bat. So you can screw it up, get a bonus bet, and uh, and uh, and uh, bet again. So again, FanDuel.com slash Boston. You're into the hockey playoffs, obviously, but as you know, NBA playoffs underway as well. And FanDuel is the exclusive partner of the NBA. And right now, new customers can get a no-sweat first bet of up to $1,000. That is $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. All you have to do is go to FanDuel.com slash Boston, download the app. Super safe and easy. You get paid instantly when you win. No better place to bet all the playoff action that is America's number one sports book. That includes hockey, basketball, uh, whatever floats your boat here. So again, FanDuel.com slash Boston. Get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. FanDuel.com slash Boston. All right, we roll on and we are joined by a special guest here on the Pucks with Hags podcast, Boston Comedy Festival winner, host of Dirty Water TV, Malden native, uh, local legend, Dave Russo is here and and a, a rabid Bruins fan. Dave Russo is here to kind of give us some perspective on what we're all thinking and feeling. What's going on, Dave? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for mentioning that I'm from Malden, so obviously everyone knows that I have a weapon. All right, how's that sound? <laughs> and also, I have a gold chain with the Bruins logo on. If you really want to know how much of a Bruins fan I am, 
Uh, they're a lot of fun going through metal detectors. That's well, all you right. know what? It's one of those. But they're all they're all hockey fans. They know who the Bruins are. So they let me go. That's uh, right. Okay, the Bruins. This is the biggest thing that I see that's going on still in the world. Because I don't know about you guys. I'm still, i still can't believe it's actually over. I mean, I know it's been four yeah. months now. But my whole thing is this. Okay, this is what I, I I have disagreements with. My Godfather, who's into the fantasy sports, love sports this whole time. We go back and forth. He dislikes the Panthers so bad that if I walk in the room and mention them. He'll punch me in the face, pretty much. I'm the opposite. I was like, the Bruins were the champions. We're the best team in the league. They beat us. We saw what happened. We should have won. A couple mistakes, obviously. But they beat us. I don't want them to lose to somebody else. That means we're double losers. You know what I mean? I want to continue to be the first loser. It still isn't very fun. But, uh, yeah, so I'm rooting for uh, the Panthers to win the whole thing. I'm, I'm rooting for Kachuk. Uh, I got past videos of me kind of praising the kid. I knew his pop. And I, just I was going to say, if you're from Malden, you got to root for the Kachucks, right? It's kind of oh, the whole thing is, is I I knew it. I just knew it. I just had a feeling that these guys are supposed to be in Bruins uniforms. As those guys, yeah. the, the players that we like, people like the Marshawns, the Kachuk, we like those players. We want them on our team. But you know what? Those guys beat us. They haunt us. They players like us haunt us. And that's what I think happened. And this, I mean. The kid, man, the kid Kachuk gets gets a, that major penalty and then gets the game winner the next game. Oh, I get chills, man, because that's playoff hockey. That's champion. I'm sorry. I, I, that made me a fan of the kid and, and more or less of a fan of Oma, even though I love our team. I don't want Oma. What's he doing? He's a goalie for a reason. Stay in the net. In the net. Right here. You don't go around. You, know, you scored yep. your goal. You made your point. Get in the net. Anyway, sorry. He like there was there was Dave there was something about him in the playoffs like beyond the injury, where like he was clearly getting bothered by the pressure of the expectations of the stage of what was going on. Where you saw him doing things, like, to your point, he was not doing all year. The stuff where he was going flying out of the net and and trying to play pucks and leaving wide open net for like these crazy goals to get scored. That bad exchange with Grizzlick. Uh, that led to the overtime game winner. He was doing things. He was frenetic and overactive in the net and doing things he was not doing all year. And I think that was about what was upstairs rather than any groin injury that he had or whatever he was playing through. So, so if I can mention one thing, I always used to say this whenever I played sports. Don't think. God protects the stupid. When you start thinking, then that's when shit, I'm sorry, that's when stuff breaks down. Just be the champ, you know? I, I mean, sweet, I mean, do you imagine? He, he's like, here's my guy, Grizzly, the guy who's phenomenal with the puck, faster than ever. Let me shoot a pass to the other guy. I, was, I, 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 I couldn't believe it. Thank God we yeah, hit the so over me, on that bet. Let me ask you this. <laughs> as a fan, as you said, you still can't believe it. Like, what stage of gr- what stage of grief are you in at this point? You know, as a fan, can you, like... I still feel like I walked into my house and everything was gone. You know, like that that's where I'm at. Like where and like just I I can't process it even still all of this time. Where are you? Where are the people you're talking to? Like the voice of the fan like Okay. <laughs> I think I know where I'm at. I kind of feel like a stalker. Because every you know every night I'm are the Panthers playing? Do they win? Do they win? Okay, so we're still we're still only the second worst team, best team. You know what I mean? So I, I kind of like that. I, I can't let it go. There's so much hockey left, guys. There's so much hockey left. I mean, I, I was I was watching the Golden Knights the other day, spank Edmonton, and early in that game, Edmonton was like pass, 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 pass. I'm like, I'm looking at the guys go. These guys aren't going to lose at all. Then next you know they lost six to one. I go, wow, playoff hockey. What so, what bothered you the most, uh, Dave, in that series uh, when you were watching it? When you watched things unfold? When you know whether it was the defenseman that couldn't handle like the pressure that flowed. I know, I know the answer. I, was... know the answer. I know the answer. I know the answer. We scored, I believe. I mean, you would be more of a statistician. Over four goals a game, correct? Yep. Okay. Yep. So I noticed this: what the Bruins would do, they'd get a pass. Okay, the right wing would pass to the left wing, like a give and go. And then they would they, they weren't doing that third pass. They weren't doing that. They were doing a pass and one shot, pass one time, pass one time. When back in the day, they would you would think they were going to do the one time, and they'd pass it right back, and they would just float it right in. I think they rushed. They rushed. They they did. I know you're not supposed to like. like let me rephrase. You're not supposed to like. Oh, you pass too much. I think they they needed that extra pass because that was their smoothness. That was like boom. So. Yeah, if that made any sense whatsoever, yeah. but I know what I was thinking well, in my head. Well, no, it, it made sense, and ahead, I think Jeff, that's sorry. what Kachuk and Bennett and Verhage and all the guys in the Florida were doing. They were making the extra pass. Right. They were finding the guy 
open in the seam. And like, look, uh, uh, bottom line too, as far as Kachuk goes, and you kind of were making this point, like everybody wants to talk about the Oilers and, you know, McDavid, Drysaddle. Everybody wants to talk about the Maple Leafs during the regular season, these teams during the regular season that run and gun, that score tons of points, that light it up, you know, score, Pasternak scored 60 goals. Like everybody wants to talk about that. The playoff performers are a different breed. They're nastier, bigger, more physical. They impose their will a little bit more. Like, Kachuk is that guy. As soon as the Florida Panthers got Kachuk this offseason and they were adding him to a team that won the President's Trophy last year, that's when you kind of had to say, "Uh uh-oh. And, you know, obviously they had injuries. They kind of, you know, went up and down and coasted through the regular season. Their old man had to call them out and say the whole team was soft on Ottawa radio towards the end of the season, which, like, Keith, like, woke up the entire Florida Panthers team by ragging on them on sports radio. But, like... You know, Kachuk is the kind of player that you want on your team that gets it done in the playoffs, and he showed it in that first round. Yeah, um, I uh, so many things go in my, my mind when you talk about uh, the playoff hockey. Uh, Thornton back in the day, number twenty-two, my favorite number because I used to love Brad Park. I yep. still think to this day he he changed the momentum of that series uh, back in 11 twelve, and yep. I get chills when I think about it because. Uh, no, he was taking like boxing lessons off season. So, you know, this fight is out in the NHL, but they're like, this guy's taking lessons. What? Uh, that's yeah. a little different. <laughs> we did it actually, Joe. Well, we did a good documentary on that at NBC during that time of Joe. That's and his, right. Uh, boxing was very, very, With very Carolyn well Mano. Done. I remember Man- that. Mano, Tori, Tori Champagne. We we did it. We went yes. to his gym and did that, uh, and it was amazing. Just kind of going through his workout. But Joe was great. He, he he was he was our he was our analyst too. He was we do interviews with him after every game and he, i mean joe uh sean um the phenomenal uh guy and no, his, whole- his, his his uh lighting up a cigar and saying suck it felger on uh live ah. tv after <laughs> after the bruins won in vancouver after game seven was a classic sean thornton moment it's a ton of fun but no you're right you're right there <laughs> dave let me ask you this because you mentioned florida and you're kind of rooting for them now yeah I, I'm, I'm torn on that because does this make you feel better knowing that the team that beat you might actually go on or does it make you feel worse knowing if you just snuck it out that Toronto is, wasn't that great. As Joe mentioned, these pretty teams that play nice and they move the puck and they do all of this stuff, you'd have to think the Bruins playing at their absolute best if they could have pulled it together and righted the ship in round two. Toronto looked like completely, it looks like a very beatable team. Yeah. I, uh, I'm i strange. I'm st- I still haven't gotten over girlfriends that broke up with me 10 years ago, but I'm already over the Bruins that they lost because this is one thing I know I can't say. What if we did this? For- I, wa- I, was- I watched every game. I was at games. I know exactly what they could have done already. They didn't do it. It didn't happen. I was I was dancing and then I stopped dancing when when that that happened. I mean it was it 88 seconds left. How ironic! 88 seconds. Pass the next goal, the first goal of the thing, the season of the thing. 88 seconds left. Boom! They scored the goal. It was just uh, yeah, some over. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, and I, I said this I think to Zanis last week too. Like Bergeron was playing with a herniated disc in his back. You know, like it, they weren't going to win the cup. As soon as he played that last game of the regular season in Montreal and he hurt his back, like maybe they were going to win a few rounds, but the, he was not going to be able to play at the level that he needs to play at for two months in the playoffs with a herniated disc in his back. You know? and, and, and I think some fans that maybe that makes them feel a little better. No. And once that happened, the kind of the, I think their fate was sealed to a degree, but like for some fans, it's not going to help at all. I, I wanted to ask you a question on that one. So, I, I, maybe I wasn't aware of that. So he really got injured in the last game, like in a freak accident. That's what happened. That Montreal game, that game when his family was there. His parents were there. Family. Game, correct. He hurt his back in the first period, herniated his disc in that game. And I guess asking some of the players and asking around, he herniated his disc a couple of years ago in training camp too. It's a second second time. Like he's thirty seven. He's getting old man injuries now, right? Like hmm. it happens. Um, <sighs> But he took a lot more time, I guess, in camp, and he missed basically all of training camp when he did it before, which was like a month, you know, five, six weeks. And he only missed, what, like a week, 10 days, whatever, and came back. And it was a minus six when he came back. Kachuk beat him on a one-on-one battle in overtime for the game winner. You know, he was on the ice with a minute to go when they were uh, holding the lead in the third period. Clearly, he was not himself, and he was not, you know, the Patrice Bergeron that we know, and he was trying to play through it. But... Uh, you know, my point being, I think for like people that look at things logically 
as soon as he got hurt, you're going to say to yourself, they're not going to win if Patrice Bergeron's compromised, playing at 50%, like whatever he was while he was playing through the bad back. But like my question to you, Dave, is do you want to make some kind of plea now in the podcast to Patrice Bergeron to come back and play next year? Are you okay with him and David Krejci going out like what happened in the first round of the playoff? Because I think a lot of people are going to have a hard time thinking that might be the end of Patrice Bergeron's career, okay. the way it ended for him. All right. I, uh, I think both of them are coming back. I think yep. uh, we won the President's Trophy this year, so we're going to make it past the first round next year. Uh, <laughs> Florida Panther style? Yeah, I, I, I absolutely think that's going to happen. I, I kind of, you know, when you feel that pain and that loss of that, of that and I've had that before in my life, I'm not going to explain how, uh, million dollars. Anyways, when you lose a million dollars, you have that pain. Uh, these guys yeah. have felt that pain. They never want to feel that again. That's why Florida beat us. They felt the pain last year. They were the presence. I, I really believe that. And now that I'm finding out that Patrice was actually injured, I didn't actually realize that. I He was in a catch-22. And, you know, if I knew he was legitimately injured, I think I could have gave him his answer. He could have got one extra step. Check this out. You live in Boston. It's the playoff. If your lip is falling off your face, you better play. If you have an eyeball. Yep. Okay, you have to play. That's the thing. You can't pay for Martinez. You can't Roger Clemens. I have a thing on my finger. You got to play. So he's a hockey player. I'm getting chills. You know he's going to play. But mm -hmm. he's so smart and he's such he's such an original that I think he wish he made that extra pass and said, "Listen, I want to play. This is everything I want to do to play. This stupid freak axe is the worst thing of my life ever. I'm having a nightmare. But I have to be honest with you. If you think I'm a wimp, then you're wrong. This guy's better than me right now." That extra pass, yeah. and I know he wishes he said that right now. I, I, I know he does because, but he has to do that. You're in a no-win If you're in Boston, you don't play, and, and, you're, and you're Patrice Bergeron, and you lose, and you don't play, oh, I mean, just think about it. Just think about it. So, yeah. You can't it's hate not his on DNA, him, right? right, to say I'm not going to play. Like, it's not, he played through a punctured lung in 2013. Right. And we trust him. We trust him. We would have forgiven him. We would have forgiven him. Well, it's but, not but, just that, But though. you are yeah. right, though. Like, the series turned – when Bergeron came back in game five, the series turned in game five. They had a three to one lead. Pavel Zaka and Charlie Coyle were playing really well as the, as the two, the top two centers. They won those two games in Florida. They kind of righted the ship and found their game and things really turned the other way when Bergeron came back in game five. And there were a number of different things. It wasn't just Bergeron coming back, right. but like, it's a legit question that you have to ask if, and I've advocated for this a couple of times that they would have been better off saying, you know what, Patrice, we've got a 3-1 lead in the series. Give the herniated disc another week uh, to heal, another three, four, five days. That's we're going to keep trying. We're going to coach this series like we're winning 3-1. to one. We're going to hold you back and hope we can get through it and we can get you back in the second round, and maybe you'll be closer to 100% Patrice Bergeron. Oh. You know, it's, it's hard for the organization to say that to a Hall of Fame player, the guy that's the heart and soul of the team. But I think it's a legit question to ask if, like, Montgomery, Don Sweeney, Cam Neely should have stepped in and said, maybe, you know, we sit out the next couple of games, see if we can close this one out, and then bring you back in the second round. It, but you're right, it's catch-22. Because hockey I, I, players I still think, through everything. I still think, I don't know how you feel, John, I still think the coach can keep him out. I think the coach, if the coach knows how, if he's that bad. Yeah. And I love Monty. Look, at I'm a fan of the guy. I, he's a humane. He's a, he's a humane grab. Yep. Yep. Okay, so he's a New England. So I don't know if he grew up in New England, but to me, that's a New he England guy. Grew up guy. in Montreal, Dave. Okay, he's a Montreal guy that went to UMaine. Okay, well, I don't know how many. Which people is an interesting actually, combination. Yeah, I was going to say, how many people actually do that? Yeah. But I just know he's got New England ties, so he's won something for us. I think yep. UMaine wins, Dave Russo wins. That's how I feel, you know. Um, but I think you know he's that coach's coach thing. I just um, he he knew the right answer. He knew what he should have done. He knows it. Well. You see this a lot. The easy thing for coaches to do across all sports is to do the conservative thing, like to do what you've been doing, to do what's worked. Montgomery, strangely enough, did a lot of weird stuff that he hadn't been doing, which was a little bit odd, and I, I know he's been criticized for. There is a catch-22, though, when it comes to a lot of things. If you pull the Vezina favorite and put in an untested guy, up 3-1 like everyone thought, he gets shelled, series goes sideways from there, it'll be like, what did you put Swayman in for? That's crazy. Ugh. If Bergeron doesn't play and they lose game five, why aren't you playing Bergeron if he's ready? <laughs> no, it's almost like, it's the same thing like everybody who watches baseball, it's so easy. Like, 
Uh, the manager leaves the pitcher in. He gives up a hit. You should have brought in the guy in the bullpen. You bring the guy from the bullpen, and he gives up a hit. What are you bringing this guy in for? It's, you know what, it's, so, that's just how it goes with all of this yeah. stuff. Yeah. With the goalie thing, though, it's not – you weren't bringing an unproven guy We all in. agree. You, we you, all agree like, what he should have done. It was a goalie done. rotation that worked But you don't know how he would have done. Perfectly. Yeah. And then they veered away from what had been working all year long when they got to the playoffs because they went with the hockey sure. convention of – you need one goalie. And I was you always have surprised to have number one. When Most it's, guys, you know, yeah. Bruins fans, Dave, you know, I know, Xanis knows. We watched Andy Moog and Reggie Lemlin go back and forth in the playoffs, and they had a lot of success with bouncing between two guys. It's possible. It can be done. And I think they it's an easy second guess to say they should have stuck with that and what worked with them all year and what worked for this team. And going away from it was, you know, part sure. of what sunk them. But some people might say, it's the playoffs, you don't do that. What teams yeah, rotate yeah, yeah. goalies in the playoffs? You, you don't. Most teams play one until the other guy gives you an up, gives you a reason not to. It's just, that's conventional playoff thinking, even if it worked in the regular season. So I think he was damned if, damned if you do, damned if you don't a lot. But anyway, go ahead, Dave. I, I, let me ask you this. Do you think next year, if these two goalies are on our team, do you think he's going back-to-back back next year? Do you think he's even thinking about having Almar go the whole, all? no. He's going back to back. Absolutely not. He learned his lesson, and you know what? I, look, I yep. didn't even realize this because of my ADHD. I didn't realize that we actually did that. We so when I find wait a minute, all year long we went we went back and back and back and back. We never went five Almost. in a row. The whole back no, half of the yeah. year. No, Allmark never played okay. five games in a row. Dude, I'm, I'm a that, that a two or three in a row. Like at some point, but it was almost an even split. Two uh, on one as far off, as the games and then dead played. split down the down down the second half was a dead split. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and I'm for a, the whole season uh, was almost an even. And split. actually, Swayman's numbers the second half of the year were as good, if not even slightly yeah. better. Um, so the, they were playing every other day, and Swayman's overall like metrics were ju- were a hair better than Allmark's uh, in the second half. So not only was it balanced performance wise, it was almost identical when they went when they alternated. That's interesting. That's yeah. interesting. But I, I have to tell you something. There's a couple of things that I didn't understand. So this is what I thought of. In the last 16 games, if I'm not mistaken, were they 16 and 0 in the last 16 games for the playoffs? They were like some ridiculous. So my thought process was, whoever's on that team, those are the guys who start. I'm sorry if other people didn't make it because I know number 17, who I love, Nick Foligno, it's my dad's favorite number. Yeah, yeah, love yeah. him as a player, but he didn't play for a long time, and he kind of looked yeah. to me like he looked like he stood out a little bit. I- I'm a master of the basics guy. If you do this all year round, you don't fix what's not broken. And uh, this way, you don't think. You think. What do you do? He thought. Why do you think? Don't think. God protects us too, but just do what you did. Just do what you're doing. It's working. Oh, let's do this. No, no, don't do that. Look what happened. When when Jim Montgomery has these choices next year, Dave, before the playoffs, he's going to think in his head, God protects the stupid. That's going to be his way. I'm a fan. I love the Canadian people. (laughs) I don't want them to think bad bad of me, but uh, I definitely think next year, if we have the same situation, they're going back and forth. They're not not having a nice day in there. No, no. 100%. 100%. Like, he, yeah. like, the, I, I was saying to Zanis earlier, uh, I was encouraged by how much Montgomery fell on the sword in that press conference earlier this week because right after game seven, he was basically saying, I don't really have any regrets about any choices that I made. And he was saying that he was confused about what had just happened, like, over the course of the series and that they had lost. And, like, he was saying all these things that were red flags and just, like, bad signs right. and warning signs that, like, this guy was kind of caught up in the moment and it, and it got too fast for him during the series. But the fact that, he like, he realizes how many mistakes he made now makes you feel a little better, but that he's going to do something differently, to your point. He's going to rotate the goalies next time. He's going to do things during the regular season that work. He's not going to, you know, split Patrice Bergeron and Brad Marchand up to start game five, which he didn't do all year long. All year long. You know, there was a lot of things he did that uh, it kind of made you scratch your head during the series. Yeah, I I wondered. uh, You know what I also thought? Uh, Zanis, did you ever play ice hockey? This is the only sport I did not play. Okay, so check this out. When I, I know, I, I think actually, I think we talked about this before. If I'm on a Monday night pickup league, all right, and we're playing against the other team, a pickup league, and they have 10 guys on their team, but my team has like 17 guys. So I'm not getting on as often. I'm not gelling with that guy. And then every third yep. shift, I'm with a different dude. It yep. kind of seemed like there was too many guys on the team and they had the, and they weren't getting enough ice time they weren't gelling you know, 71 was on fire hall was on fire at one point and i'm seeing yes. him every ninth shift i'm like dude every time he's on something's happening it just yeah. i kind of felt that way a little bit 
Yeah. And his ice well, time was like 11, 12 minutes at the end of the night for those games. And you're wondering why he doesn't play more. Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah. Let me ask you but, this. You spend a lot of time Real with quick, the Joe, before you go, I mean, Joe, let, real quick, I wanted to say one thing. You mentioned Montgomery. We talked about this earlier in the podcast. And I didn't say it then, but I wanted to circle back to it. You mentioned Montgomery c- kind of realized some of the things that he'd done there. Yeah. My unfounded, not based in anything or anyone I've spoken to opinion was – that wasn't him talking. That was oh, of course. that was some somebody told him you should have done this. You yes. should not have done this. He was brought oh. into a room and scolded. And well, said, that's what I said. That, yeah, that's what I said earlier. Like either he was he reading all this the on stories his own. Yeah. where everybody was crushing him for the mistakes he made, or management brought him into a room and said, "Here's yes. a punch yeah. list of things that you screwed oh. up." They looked at him and, and said, to "Take accountability Jim, for them." Jim. But Tell us 100%. what you've done. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. But uh, <laughs> what I was going to say, David, you spend a lot of time with the alumni, do Bruins Foundation stuff. Have you talked to those guys much uh, since they lost? And what's kind of the feeling among the alumni after watching what went down? Uh, the new president, uh, Frank Simonetti. Uh, yes. Stoneham yeah. legend, by the way. He was, uh, yeah. he really just, uh, a Stoneham legend. Absolutely. Yes. He, uh, and a Norwich graduate. So, you know, he's very yep. disciplined. He, That's uh, right. He took the dis- he took the high road. Um, I didn't really get much out of him. You know, I said, "Hey, man, how you doing today?" Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, I think yeah. I mean they, they take it to heart. These guys, I mean, they, they bleed it, you know. And uh, so I didn't really get a good re- I didn't get a, a huge read off him. Um, but I know he's like, a, "We'll get him next year" type of guy. That's 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 what I felt. Um, other than that, I think the alumni are probably uh, just as stunned as we all are. Just as stunned as we all are. You know, I mean, by the way, speaking of, which, of the alumni, I just, uh, this is, if I can, this is Todd Angeles, uh, star spangled <laughs> vino wine that he signed for me last night. Nice. Uh, it's you brought go. to you. It's brought to you by Falcino Vineyard, a taste of Italy, one hour north of Boston, next to Nashua in Hollis, <laughs> New Hampshire. Yes. This is also my Malbec. Uh, the more you drink, the taller I look, uh, all that's the money a, that's goes a to charity. professional plug right there, Russo. I like oh, yeah. it. I've been listen. You didn't even know I've been drinking some classical on the side, right? A little Pinot Noir. <laughs> so <I'm on. laughs> yeah, uh, you mentioned Bruins alumni Joe and I. When the game ended, I think took the elevator down with Cam Neely, and he oh, looked yeah. like he looked like he was going through every single emotion all at once uh, uh, there. Uh, you, for, know, you were on the elevator ra- with them. Oh between, yeah. Between rage, sadness, disappointment, just. I, w- I was worried he was just going to haul off and start pounding the crap I out of just anybody gonna... close to him. And he so just Joe, so he Joe, he went brave enough. bottles. He was went brave enough. Feel... How do you feel, Cam? You weren't brave enough to do that? <laughs> the <laughs> first person that spoke this. to him the... would have That could have been, been my million-dollar moment right there if oh, I had done that. I would have been, like, been a video on his camera. Hey, how do you feel right now? I got... <laughs> it would have been, been bouncing Claude Lemieux off the ice if anybody said anything <laughs> to him at that point. I got a signed Cam Neely. I got a signed hat by Cam Neely over here in my room. Uh, when we won it last year, I'm a, I'm a fan of Cam. Uh, you know, once again, he believes it. I can only imagine. He just been like, like, like what just happened? Where am I? It was, it was, it was unbelievable. Uh, Joe mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the, the Bruins Foundation. What else you got going on personally right now in terms of your own, uh, your your own My entertainment, own. your 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 shows, your appearances? What else, what, yeah, what else you got going on? Uh, well, you know what? I'm, I'm excited that I, I'll be um, I'll be performing at the Laugh Factory at the Tropicana in Las Vegas, May 28th through June 4th. 14 shows in Vegas. I've been I've been going to Vegas. I've been performing at the Tropicana in Vegas since March of 2003. This is my 20th anniversary coming up, and I couldn't be more excited. I'm the only one that goes to Vegas to get sober. <laughs> I'm on stage. You ready for this? Uh, there's 14 shows. I'm on stage 42 times. I can't afford to drink. I'll fall over. You're crazy out there. But that's what I got going on that. And I mentioned the uh, Falcino Vineyard. Um, I really do have my own Malbec wine uh, brought to you by Falcino Vineyard in Hollis, New Hampshire. It's, uh, we launched it in January 2018. It actually sold out in six days. It's one of the top sellers. I call it my pandemic relief fund. Because when things were going down, people were buying my wine. There you go. Yeah, that, that, there's there was an uptick in drinking. Uh, uh, you uh, think? I don't think we've stopped. Lot of, and there was an uptick in drinking since we lost the Bruins game. To, I haven't stopped. To, just keep that train rolling, Dave. Total wine going there and having them just bring crates of stuff and just put it in the back of your car. I was like, this is amazing. Uh, it's, it's, weekly, and, and you get to drink it with deliveries. people. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. So good stuff. <laughs> Joe, anything else to add before we let Dave go here? No, that's it, Dave. Thanks, bud. We'll make this a, a regular thing. We'll have you on again, bud. I'd love to be on. Appreciate it. And uh, go uh, go Florida. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Rudy for enough. Kachuk and the Panthers. That's Kachuk, how we'll yeah, end it right O2, there. Hey, listen, he's, he's went to Malden Catholic, the 02148. Come on. That's right. Yeah, once again, uh, Dave Russo joining us, Boston Comedy Festival winner, host of Dirty Water TV, uh, and uh, avid Bruins fan, dropping some knowledge here, a lot of fun. Uh, thank you to Dave. Uh, thanks, Joe, uh, as we wrap it up. And as we said, we will continue on with the Pucks with Hags podcast throughout the offseason, kind of uh, as there are new developments. And it'll be an interesting and extremely eventful offseason, as we know, uh, for the Boston oh, Bruins. Really Pod, fun. as always, is brought to you by... FanDuel, go to FanDuel.com, take advantage of this special offer, 1,000 uh, no sweat first bet, bonus bets return to you, $1,000 bonus bets, no sweat first bet, when you go to FanDuel.com slash Boston. I am John Zanis, this is Joe Haggerty, this has been Pucks with Hags, make sure please subscribe, rate, and review. We need those ratings and reviews, okay? So just jump on wherever you listen to your podcast. Jump on. If you like the show, give a rating, give a review. Really super helpful to us. And you can obviously catch the video version on the CLNS Media Bruins Rinkside YouTube channel. Thanks again for watching slash listening. We will catch you guys next time.